Um, yeah. And if I was actually to sing, I've never sung karaoke before. Have you? Once. Once. What was the song? Humpty Dance. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by Stephen Calarco. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give you a quick recap of the week that was, what's new in my neck of the woods, and just give you some insight as to what is going on over here in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. So, last week, pretty low-key, overall coaching, a little bit slower. I have some athletes that are out of town. Uh, Keelan had actually signed with a G League team, so I didn't see him uh, the last couple weeks. Dakota's been in and out. Ed has been in and out. Uh, So it was actually kind of nice because it afforded me some time to work on some back-end stuff for RTS, working on some stuff for IFAST. Man, just trying to prep for this week, if I'm being honest, because this is the week before vacation, which, as you probably know, is just absolute chaos, right? There's no nice way to put it. The week before and the week after vacation just tend to be absolutely insane because leading up to, you're trying to get two weeks of work done. And then on the back end, you feel like you're playing catch up. So this week, all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, Kindle has some stuff at school. Uh, Let's see, I'm shooting my monthly video uh, content stuff with Paul tomorrow at IFAST. So excited for that. I love shooting the content. I love creating it. I love putting it out there, but a lot of prep work uh, because I'm not only shooting the videos, but I'm doing the bulk of the write-ups this week as well, which again, trying to make this as easy as possible for both me and Paul uh, because Paul has little people and he's going on spring break next week as well. So got video stuff to do. Uh, I've got a couple extra clients that are actually in town this week, some distance clients. I got three podcasts to record on Thursday, I believe we have Nick Lamb, Shante Cofield, and my guy Joel Jameson coming back on the show. So got to get prepped and ready for those. Get those ready to go out because obviously we'll have a show posted next week. So yeah, man, while last week was kind of chill, this week is a little bit insane. Not to mention just the usual weekly stuff that I have going on like you know, uh, stuff around the gym, uh, coaching hours, uh, you know, programs, obviously, you not you don't just have the one week of program, you have two weeks of programs to try and make sure everybody is caught up and ready to go. Because, you know, look, the last thing I want to do is put the world on hold just because I'm going on vacation. So I try and get all those things done, dot all my I's, cross all my T's so that when I go on vacation, I can be as detached from the rest of the world as possible. And I can really enjoy this time with my family and Another side benefit to this is uh, one of my best friends, he was actually the best man at my wedding. I was the best man at his wedding. His his name is Wes. Probably haven't talked about him on the show a bunch, but they live in Fort Wayne and his entire family is going to be down there the same week. So it's great. I get to see one of my best friends. We get a week to hang out together. His kids and my kids are about the same age. Everybody gets along. So yeah, needless to say, I think I'm excited and ready for spring break next week. Grind it out this week, get all the things done so that I can show out and have a just relaxing vacation next week. So, man, that's really it. Nothing too exciting going on in my neck of the woods. I hope you're doing well. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to jump into this awesome episode with my guy, Stephen Clarker. We cover all the bases, touch on a ton of topics, and I really think you're going to love it. It seems like every day I talk to a young trainer or coach who is frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if that sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you, who are serious about the results they get and who know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is going to take the last 20 years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In it, you'll learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. How to create the culture, environment, and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results. 
and the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym, from squatting and deadlifting to pressing and pulling and everything in between. Of course, there's a ton more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the cert is all about. Now here's the thing, spots for the certification will only open twice per year for a limited time only. To get on the insiders list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, completecoachcertification.com, and then stay tuned for emails in the coming weeks. Thanks so much for your support, and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the Complete Coach Certification when it launches. Stephen Calarco is the owner of The Strength Spot in West Hartford, Connecticut, a private training facility dedicated to transforming lives through strength training and nutritional coaching. His goal is to help his clients and athletes move better, get stronger, and improve their quality of life without gimmicks and fads. Furthermore, Stephen is wholeheartedly committed to the growth and development of the fitness profession through his constant education and practical application. It's his mission to positively impact and change as many lives as possible throughout the training process and leave the fitness industry in a better place than where he found it. In this wide-ranging episode, Stephen and I cover topics like what it's really like to own and operate your own gym, how he strives to find balance between his work and home lives, his thoughts on nutrition and meal prep, and how continuing education has changed and will continue to change in the months and years to come. My chats with Steve always feel more like back and forth discussions versus him just answering my questions, so I really hope you enjoy the dialogue here. But enough for me, let's do this. Steve, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to have you back on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, thanks for having me, Mike. It's a huge honor to be on, um, not only one time, but uh, as a repeat guest as well. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So um, for those who don't know me, my name is Stephen Calarco. I'm a strength and conditioning coach, have been one for about 14 years now. Um, and I just opened, um, the strength spot, which is a private, um, training studio in West Hartford, Connecticut. Love it, man. Love it. And as you alluded to, it's been a couple years since we've had you on. So like what's new in your neck of the woods, man, what's happening? Yeah. So, um, lots of things. So I have a new, uh, a, a, a goddaughter now. So my brother just had a niece. She's six months old. Her name is Charlie. Nice. Um, so they were out this past weekend and my nephew is about to turn four next week. And I'm sure, you know, the kid is just endless energy. Like he, <laughs> right. came, o- he, he came over to the apartment and all he wanted to do was wrestle. Like yes. all he wanted to do was <laughs> wrestle, which led to him like biting his lip and just profusely bleeding all over the place. And I was just like, Solid. Oh, great. Uncle, uncle of the year. Yes. Um, so that's new. Um, I moved into a new apartment with my girlfriend, which is a big step. Um, and then opening the gym, like other, other than that, it's just been a lot of stuff going on. I love it. I love it. So man, let's just jump right into the fray here. Cause I want to hear about that experience. What has it been like opening your own gym? Eye opening. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, you, you know what I mean? Like when you, when you, think about opening a gym or you're talking about with other people they're like oh yeah i'll just i'll sign a lease i'll get some space and then you know if i build it like they will come and it is not that like at all and um you know luckily i had i had a following i had clients that were willing to come with me and you know i had uh, so i had a previous business partner and that kind of fell apart in 20 february of 2020 right before like the right. world shut down right so i sold him some equipment i kept some for myself obviously and then i was able to make a bigger purchase like right before it was impossible to get any equipment so i had this all and i was training people out of a 400 um two car 400 square feet two car garage for like a year until this place kind of fell in my lap wow and at that, at that time, like, and you know, when you're training somebody in a garage, like it's hard for somebody to do like intervals on the assault bike and like a 90 degree garage, like that's a great way for somebody <laughs> right. to like pass out right? Um, while you're training them. So, um, so the space kind of fell in my lap and, and then it's just kind of been a whirlwind from there. And it was just, I don't know, just. It was just very eye opening. That's the best way to describe it. There were so many things like I did not think about when you're thinking about opening a gym. And when all of that kind of piles on top of another, 
and you have to be, you know, the accountant and the social, uh, social media marketer and yeah. all this other type of stuff, it can become like very overwhelming, like very quickly. Yes. Yeah. I've got this smile on my face. The people at home can probably feel it, but <laughs> like, like people don't understand, right? They think it's so easy. They're like, oh, like I'm a great coach. I'm killing it in this private gym and you know, I'm going to go start my own thing. And I'm like, Hey, that's great, man. Just know and understand There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that you never see. So you mentioned there's stuff that you didn't think about. Yeah. Help open these people's eyes. What are things that you never would have thought of that are now on your plate since you opened your own gym? Okay. So I remember, what was it? A couple of years ago, you guys redid your turf with play, right? Or we did your flooring with play. Yeah. Right. People don't understand. Like to have nice flooring, my my gym is 1,500 square feet. My flooring was (laughs) $11,000. Yeah. You you know what I mean? And so, um, and you know, you want the gym to look nice for people and you want, um, and you want it to look a certain way because they're spending, you know, thousands of dollars with you annually. Um, and then you're just like, oh my God, like this is what it's going to cost just for flooring, not even equipment and stuff like that. And so my space, we're in an, in an industrial building, right? So luckily we have two community bathrooms, which is frustrating and it's yes and no. So it is huge, but like, it's frustrating because I am relying on other people to maintain them in a Uh, fashion that I want them to be maintained. Right. Yes. And it's an industrial building. So it's not like a brand new, you know, luxurious office space and stuff like that. So there's things that come, um, come in line with that. And then I remember, um, Pete Dupree had wrote an article years ago about like aggressively negotiating your lease. And I wish I had done, I I wish I had done that a little bit more aggressively. Right. So, you know, I'm using my lawyer as a, you know, um, a negotiating person kind of dealing with the lease. And we're talking about things that I can like, are non-negotiables for me or things that I can, you know, uh, give in a little bit. And I was under the gun because I needed a space. It wasn't really feasible to keep training people in the garage. And, you know, I made some concessions and I really wish like, I had, I really wish I had like spoken to other business owners in the complex Mm. before about what it's like with this landlord. And then, and then maybe just waited it out a little bit more. But on his end, he was like, Hey, I have other people looking at the space. I need a decision quickly. And, you know, I'm between a rock and a hard place. And then I decided to do it. And then, you know, that's it. Yeah. He had the leverage. Right. Right. Exactly. And like, it was just weird. So in, I don't know about in um, Indiana or in Indianapolis, but in Connecticut, you have to have one parking space for every 100 square feet of usable space, regardless whether you're in LA fitness or like you're a private training facility. So a lot of my issues when searching for spaces had come down to parking and then noise. Like I didn't want to be in like a retail complex next to like you know, an insurance agency or like a restaurant and stuff like that. And then, you know, we're slinging heavy deadlifts and all this other type of stuff. And you know, my neighbors hate me for the entirety of my lease. (laughs) So that was something. And then other things you don't think about, I know I'm rambling here, but like cam charges are a huge thing. Yeah. Uh, For those who don't know what that is, that's community and maintenance charges. Um, And those tend to increase yearly um, in certain spaces. Right. Um, what else um has been a huge expense oh my god like decor um so yeah. like i didn't want the gym to just be like white walls right so i have a couple like motivational quotes on the wall i have you know i had all these like anchors to get stuff off the floor to create more space and then all of a sudden you realize you're spending hundreds of dollars just decorating yeah yeah you know and then, and then water is a huge thing. So we don't, so because I don't have a bathroom in my space, I didn't have a water fountain. So I have one of those like bubblers Yeah. and then I'm filling it. I'm, you know, I have it on auto ship of like, you know, six to eight of them a month. And then, you know, that's hundreds of dollars yeah. coming in and out. And you just don't even think about that, Yeah. that type of stuff when you're, um, when you're thinking about opening a space. Well, I'm going to tell you, you need to get one of those, uh, water systems. First of all, they're going to put you on a lease, but we've got one. We got it. We had one before, like a push button. And then post COVID, they're like, oh, we have like a hands free now. So you just put your hand in front. It's like 70, 80 bucks a month. But dude, we were just like destroying that in like Nestle water bottles or whatever it was. You know what I mean? Like, 
but do you have to does it, it i'm assuming it has to be hooked up to a water line right oh yeah oh yeah you don't have any kind of water line in yeah there. oh right. my gosh so, it should, so to do that work in a space that i'm probably not going to stay in past my three oh i got you i guess it's kind of like so now I'm just kind of like, all right, I'll bite the bullet. And I'm really persuading people to like bring your own water bottles. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? Yes. Dude, it's so funny. Like you mentioned uh, equipment and flooring. I literally had equipment underlined here because when people say, I'm going to open my own gym, they are so fired up, right? And the first thing they do is they create that equipment list. Man, when I build my perfect gym, I'm going to have this and this and this and this. And I can't tell you how many like consulting calls or mentees I've worked with. And I'm like, hey, that's great. Uh, have you priced flooring yet? No. Okay, go price flooring and then tell me how your equipment list changes because <laughs> right. when you realize you're going to spend two or three X in flooring, what you do in equipment, they are just like shocked and appalled. I'm like, dude, this is a major expense for your business. Huge, huge expense. Yeah. Huge expense. And and, and that, oh, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So, well, so here's another one, right? We looked at a space Um, in like one of these huge like field houses right where like kids are going in and they're skills training for baseball and basketball and i'm like oh this would be awesome and first off the rent is ungodly but then the cam charge legitimately our rent was going to be like 18k a month which i'm like okay like they had promised to feed us some people whatever i was like i can make that number work and they're like yeah your cam charge is 5k a month I was like, oh, hell yeah. no. Hell yeah. no. Hard, like, hard, I'm like, that's a deal task. breaker right there. So, And then other things is like, so we're in, like I said, in an industrial building and my heat is oil. So now <laughs> what the prices are. So I'm like, listen, I don't really care like if you're cold or not. Like if you're cold, get on the Echo bike when you, when you get to the gym to warm up. Like I can't have the gym at like 68 degrees right. year round. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then our oil companies around here, it's like you get for the lowest price, you have to have a minimum of 150 gallons. And right now that's like six to seven hundred dollars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm trying to make it stretch and not fill it up, um, not fill it up uh, a second time this winter or this spring. And then hopefully when oil, if oil goes down in a couple months, then I'll refill it at that time. Yeah. That's a huge expense that people don't account for. I'm telling you, man, like. You, you think of some of the big things, right? And the things that you want to think about. You think about your rent. You think about your equipment. But man, there's a lot of hidden costs there, you know? And right. then all of a sudden, oh, you want like a like a cable or like a fiber internet? There's 150, 200 bucks a month. It's like all of a sudden, right. you're like, holy cow, I literally just doubled my monthly cost from what I thought right. I was going to pay. And we did. So I'm right next to a pottery place called the Junk Pot Studio. And what he does is, have you ever done like a paint night with your wife? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he does the same thing with like clay. Okay. Right? So he yeah, has like cool. 10, 10, 10 wheels and you come build teapots or whatever. Right. So him and I were super close now. And he like, I write his program and then he pretty much is like my maintenance guy for the gym. Right. Oh, super cool. handy. Yeah. And um, so we actually share internet, which is great. Okay, there you go. And which has been a which has been a huge help. Um, and he actually has water in his space, so I go, I use the mop bucket, or like I fill up my mop bucket over there, and all this other type of stuff. So that's been really helpful to have a neighbor like that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Okay, so shifting oh, gears. Mike, oh. I, I went to I went to say one other thing. Yeah, when you open your gym, and this is hugely important for younger coaches. Um, when you work in a commercial gym, you are failing on somebody else's dime, right? Yeah. It's not, yeah. it's not costing you money. When you own your own gym, big mistakes you make could cost you hundreds or thousands of dollars. And yeah. that's a, and that's a big thing you need to consider when opening your gym. Yeah. I love it, man. Yeah. People don't re- remember that or they don't think about that. And that's something I tell all of our interns. Cause I've had a lot of interns that are like 22, 23. They're like, man, I think I'm just going to go and like start a gym right away. And I'm like, uh, 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 like pump the brakes champ. Like, I love that enthusiasm, but it's way better go and make your mistakes on somebody else's dime for six months to a year. Like, yep. get your sales pitch down. Get comfortable training people on your own. Then go do your own thing. Like, way easier sure. to fail in that environment than it is to fail in your own. And there's so much value in being in a commercial gym, right? Like, you get to talk to so many people. Yes. Right? Yes. And interact with so many people and then make a, and then make a lot of mistakes and get so many um, different experiences training so many different populations. And I just think that's very undervalued. As frustrating as it can be, 
running a commercial gyms model. Um, but I think it's still very valuable. It, it fast tracks your learning, right? 100%. Just, just 100%. Getting all those reps working with so many different people, it fast tracks you. So, okay. Changing course just a little bit here. But as an entrepreneur, you and I both know it can be difficult to find any semblance of balance between your work life and the rest of your life. So as a new entrepreneur, I, it's kind of a weird way to put it because you've been working for yourself off and on for a while now. But as a new gym owner, how have right. you gone about trying to achieve this? Uh, therapy is a big <laughs> one. So, and this is the thing, like, I don't think a lot of, you know, mental health gets thrown around a lot nowadays. I know you Agreed. just said that on your previous podcast, Agreed. right? Um, and, but like, I know, like I had a interesting um, childhood and a lot of things that I was exposed to or environments or people that I was exposed to um, kind of shape, obviously shaped who I am, but like some of the negative things have like fostered into other things or mm -hmm. snowballed into bigger things as I've gotten older. Yeah. And one thing I'll say about myself is I'm incredibly self-aware and I know things could get off the rails really quickly. So it's nice to talk to somebody and have that like third party perspective. One, it makes me a better partner in my relationship. Right. And two, right. it makes me a better, it makes me a better coach and a better business owner knowing that like, you know, talking through some of these issues or talking through like, you know, anxiety or depression, which every coach at some point in their life has to have come, yeah, come in contact, come in contact with. Yeah. And especially as a, especially as a new business owner, like it, you know, thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, they don't delay your rent. Like the rent <laughs> is due on the, fir on the first right. of every month, right? No matter, right. no matter how many clients you lose or, you know, what. So, you know, working through that anxiety and stuff like that, um, I will also say my partner has been great. Like I, you know, she's been a rock through this. And um, so luckily that, so obviously, you know, the split shifts or any of this, I, some, most nights I don't get home until seven thirty, seven forty-five. 45. Yep. Um, but we will, um, we will always eat dinner together unless there's unforeseen, um, unforeseen circumstances. That's so awesome. even if it's like eight or eight 30 a night or whatever, like it just is what it is. Like yeah. we, we eat together, we talk. Um, and that's been, and that's been really helpful. Um, and then also just not forgetting to like, let our relationship or other relationships in my life with my brother or my mom or whoever, like to go by the wayside, just because I'm focusing on my business. That's why it was great for my brother to come out and visit my family or to visit us and see, you know, my nephew and my goddaughter. And then also just being very proactive, mm, right? Like, yeah. because when you're, when you're a new business owner, you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna train everybody. I'm gonna train seven days a week. And that's <laughs> a really great way to get burnt out in like two years. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, being proactive is like, Hey, I'm going to block off this time in my schedule. I'm going to try to get out earlier on um, these two nights, you know, I'm not going to take anybody after this time, no matter what. Um, and then planning, planning date nights for, for her and I. Yeah. And, and I just like, because as the business grows, as I get busier, as I'm taking on new endeavors in the next couple of years, like, I don't want that to fall by the wayside and you yeah. literally have to be proactive and schedule it or it will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I talk about having bumpers and guardrails kind of in your life. And especially when you're starting off either as a new trainer, as a new business owner. Uh, I just had this discussion with one of my mentees a couple months ago because he was in this just massive growth state, right? Like he was killing it. And then not only was he killing it, but then he, you know, in that same time was starting to open his own space. And I said, Hey, look, one of the most important things you can do is say, Hey, there's a couple days a week. Maybe you go home a little earlier. You know, if you're going to work some on Saturday, you're done by noon you're doing date night with your wife, especially you don't have kids yet. You're doing date night with your wife, girlfriend, whoever, Saturday night. Like there has to be some form of bumpers or guardrails in there. Otherwise, the way people like us are wired, we will just work ourselves to death or until like we get sick or, you know, we lose a, an important person or a relationship in our life. Then it's like, oh, maybe I should have stopped. Well, even um, I know you mentioned in that podcast that like, Every day of the week, you guys are down for family dinner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Unless there's unforeseen circumstances, but that's huge. And I don't remember having a lot of that when I was younger. I mean, my parents like provided for us, 
but a lot of like connection and relationship building fell yeah. by the wayside because yeah. of that. Absolutely. And knowing how that affected my brother and I steers me or guides me to how I want to be a business owner, a partner, eventually a father, et cetera. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. I always talk about like you take the good things and the good memories that you have from your childhood. Right. And right. then you also think about how could I make it better or how would I want to be? And then you try and shape and mold that. And you're never perfect, right? But you're always no, no. aspiring to be better. Right. And then also understanding like who your partner is, who your kids are and what they need. Like what's yeah. their love language? How do they respond to this? How can you be there for them and still be there for yourself? Right. Yes. Love and it. I think that that's where communication between the two communication with yourself and then communication between, you know, all parties involved has been, has been great. I love it, man. I love it. Okay. So one thing I know you take very seriously is your cooking and nutrition game. So kind of right. a two parter here. Number one, what got you into this? And yep. number two, talk to me about your approach. Cause you're already, I mean, you take care of yourself. You're obviously a very fit dude. So like, what's your approach there? So, okay. So being, uh, I'm Italian, right? So a lot of, a lot of my childhood was in the kitchen, right? Yeah. Making, making sauce on Sundays and all these elaborate dinners and, and stuff like that. And I just like, it just grew on me. I like, I like that. And a lot of, I think we talked on the last podcast, like a lot of connections are made around the dinner table in yes. the kitchen, hosting people, et cetera. And that's kind of fall by the wayside now with, you know, all of these prepared um, dinners and, um, you know, prep services and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of what got me involved. And then when I lost a bunch of weight in high school, I actually taught myself how to cook even more, experimented with different recipes, how I can make them healthier, et cetera. And not a lot of people know, I almost went to culinary school, the CIA, Culinary Institute of America at a high school. Mm. And, you know, talking to other chefs and I had worked in restaurants after I graduated high school because I didn't go to college right away. And you start to realize that like, it is a grind. Like you think training is a grind, <laughs> like being in a kitchen, being a chef is a grind and it's a hot grind because <laughs> the kitchen is just super hot. Um, so, and when I visited the CIA and talked to people, I kind of made the decision. It was just more of a hobby than it was a career. Mm. And then, you know, you start to experience or experiment with different recipes and stuff like that. And, you know, while, while my girlfriend and I were looking for apartments, like, she was like, well, what are some of your non-negotiables? I was like, I need a huge kitchen. Like I have so much kitchen stuff. Yeah. Um, we needed, we needed all this space. Um, we need all the space so I could store everything and then, you know, do my thing. Um, in regards to nutrition. So it's actually interesting. I'm the heaviest I've been in five years okay. and I decided to put on some mass over the past couple of months. Um, but when I had lost all my weight, in high school, it kind of, I developed some psychological issues and trauma that came along with that. Almost, I don't want to say eating disorder-esque because it might be a disservice to people who actually have eating disorders, but the behaviors were down that, were trending in that direction. Yeah. So, so gaining the weight is really hard for me, like mentally and emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. So I've had to deal with that. And now, you know, I'm starting to cut. Um, but so how do I deal with nutrition? So I don't really prep for the week anymore. Um, but what we will do is we'll make, we'll overcook for nights and then we have leftovers for the yeah. next day yeah. or the next couple of days, or we'll batch cook. So my girlfriend makes, um, great rice and then she makes, um, these beans and, um, collard greens with like smoked turkey legs in them. And then Ooh. you make, you have to, yeah. Oh, it's great. And <laughs> you make a bunch and you make a bunch of that. And then all of a sudden you have, this for, for later in the week. Yep. And then, um, we have, so we have this huge air fryer. So we air fry a whole bunch of vegetables. Um, and then, and then, but she works from home and only goes into the office two days a week. So she's able to cook and prep, um, while she's home, right. Which makes a huge difference. And that's why like we really work well as a team and that's kind of helped keep our nutrition like on point. Yeah. I love it, man. Yeah. I think that's been, one of the things I did in the past, but it's been really helpful, you know, me getting the grill because I love to grill and smoke things yep. and that sort of thing. So I love to batch cook like meats. My wife is amazing with like the rices, the starches, potatoes, veggies. So it's like right. put it all together. You batch cook a bunch of it on Sunday 
And then, man, you're like kind of good to go for the week, at least as right. far as lunches go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So and then like I have a couple of breakfasts that I cycle through. So some of my biggest opportunities are getting enough fruits and vegetables in. Mm-hmm. Right. So if I don't have enough, like so I have this shake in the morning where I'll put spinach in it. Right. It's yeah. uh, it's unsweetened vanilla, almond milk, a banana, spinach, PB2 and protein. Great. So that's a way for me to get extra vegetables in or I have a yogurt and or a Greek yogurt and or a shake that has a bunch of fruit in it. And that's a way for me to get, um, you know, fruits in as well. I meant to ask you is, um, is your, is your grill and smoker the same? Like, no. is it a Traeger that can do both? No. Or you have two? I have two now. <laughs> I have nice. two. No, I had, uh, the Kamado, which was my, uh, father's day present to myself over, I think it was, nice. it was either, oh, over COVID or the year before. Um, but that's what really got me into it. Um, and I, I would grill everything on it, right? Like I'd yep. grill chicken and I'd grill burgers and all that. Just the prep time to get it ready took so long. So yep. then we were on vacation last year and at our vacation spot, there was just a little Weber grill. I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. It's ready in like five minutes. So, yep. so for my birthday last year, Jess bought me one of those and it's amazing. So now I got something for the fast stuff. I got something for the low stuff. It's all covered now. And that's the one thing I miss. We're on the third floor in an apartment and we've got this small balcony and we can't have grills. And that's just mm. one thing like I I really, really miss. Yes, it is pretty clutch, man. Uh, you know, something else that, that I was thinking of too, when you talked about working in a restaurant, you talk about an entrepreneurial cemetery. I'm pretty sure the close rate or failure rate of restaurants is like 99%. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's something ungodly high. So like, yeah, I don't think I would survive long in that business. That just seems so stressful. And like, just think of like the hours. Do you know what I mean? Like, because you're not, it's not just, you're not just cooking for lunch and dinner. Like you have to prep for lunch and prep for dinner and then clean the entire kitchen. It is a giant. And it's not like a quick cleanup either. You have freaking grease everywhere. Like, oh my God, it's a disaster. Yeah, I bet. Okay, let's talk Con Ed. So I know you are one of the most diligent people that I've met in my career as far as educating yourself, going to seminars, going to courses. And you and I both know like this game has changed a lot. Uh, right. Definitely in the last five, but especially in the last two to three for obvious reasons. One, so 100%. Where do you see Con Ed going in the months and years to come? Um more of like, so here's my frustrations with Con Ed, right? Like I don't want to go to a continuing education course, seminar, whatever, and just have you or have the presenter go up there with their slides and click through like their best case scenario, always <laughs> right. plan A. Cause that's never the case, right? right? Like show me, show me what happens when shit hits the fan and you have to go to plan C, not plan yeah. A, right? Like, yeah. And then show me like, how, how would you, how would you interject what you're presenting on in a group training setting, in a um, physical therapy setting, in a one-on-one or semi-private setting, right? Like how does, how does that work? Yeah. And like, what's real world practices? Because some things, some things that presenters have presented on, I'm just like, dude, this is not feasible. Like I have somebody <laughs> who's trying to lose, I have somebody who's trying to lose 50 pounds. They're probably five to 10 minutes late to their session. So I have 50 minutes. Like I'm not, I'm not hooking them up to an Omega wave. Like I'm not doing any of this type of stuff. Like what is real world application? So that's one thing. And then like your complete coach certification, like uh, Mike Boyle, CFSC, like Pat Davison's rethinking the big patterns, like those type of things, there has to be a training component to it where you get on the floor and like prove that you can execute these things or you have a keen eye of what you're looking for and you can feel what, you should or want to feel. Yeah. Right. Yep. Cause a lot of people just, you know, hop on uh, an online continuing education course. They're not even paying They're they're not even paying attention yeah. or they're in a seminar and they're in the back dicking around or, you know, <laughs> talking to, talking to whoever and not really learning anything. They get their CEUs and then that's it. And yeah. they don't, and they don't really learn anything. Um, so I think more of a integration or integrated type model where it's, you know, maybe 30, 70 of presentation and then, you know, partly Q and a, and then a lot of it being practical, like you have to tie it in together. There's a place for all three, but like, there has to be more dialogue. There has to be more questions because if you just present and you don't ask any questions, 
Like I know I've been an attendee in numerous seminars and there are a lot of questions like, can you please clarify this or how would this work in this setting? Or like, what, you know, what if this arises, like, how, how would you, how would you deal with that? And that's been, that's been huge. So I took, oh man, um, most recently, a couple of years ago, um, I took right before COVID, I took Derek Hansen's um, running mechanic certification. Yeah. And I mean, he did a lot, there was a lot of slides, but like, there was so many practical um, components to it. And so many like, well, this is how we do this for athletes. This is how we do this for general population. And then let's demo some of this. All right. What did you guys, and then he'll ask the crowd or the attendees, like, what did you guys see? Yeah. And then you say something, he's like, all right, well, this is what I saw. I'm not really worried about this. Here's why. And then you're like, oh, okay, that kind of puts the pieces together. Right. I see how, I see how this works. Yeah. You know, and then he had people on true forms where he's videotaping you in slow motion. And then you review it together. And it was like, this is how, this is what I see. You know, this that's is what cool. I would work on, et cetera. And that's like so valuable. Yeah. Versus versus somebody up there for three days, just clicking through slides. And you're just like, I can't take this anymore. Like yeah. I can't. You're ready to poke your eyes out at the end of that right. seminar. Yeah. And look like that was a big reason. And like full disclosure here, Steve and I are trying to make one of these happen at his spot here later this year. But like, that was one of the reasons I wanted to try this myself. Right. Is like, I don't want to go if I've got 100 people in a room, there's no customization. Right. Like I can't. Right. Right. Can I field right. a couple questions? Sure. But you're getting pre canned content because I can't customize it to 100 people. But right. 10, 15, 20, man, now we can go at it. Right. Like I've got my right. core stuff that I need you to know, like my training principles, my key beliefs, my thoughts. But then from there, OK, hey, what kind of environments are you in? Who are you working with? What are you struggling with? Now we can really customize that that course and that seminar to where you're at and where the group's at. So they get way more out of it. And it's not just me clicking through slides. Because look, as a presenter too, for if you're doing that for two or three days straight, like put a fork in you, you're done at the end of that weekend. So Right. And then to piggyback off of what you just said and what I said earlier, I think that there is going to be a trend of more behavioral psychology components to continuing education in the fitness space going forward. Because that's a huge foundation of what this is built on, especially personal training. Yeah. Um, like connecting with people and you have to build a rapport before like, and that's really a huge key to results because with rapport comes trust, comes communication, comes all of this, which are essential to the training process. Like you have to, it has to be a two-way street because there's things that I'm going to program or the ways that I'm going to coach that may not be right for the person I'm working with in front. And I want them to feel comfortable enough and say, Hey, like, I really don't like this or like, you know, can we try something different? Or I really don't like the way you communicated this to me, yada, yada, yada. And then, and I think that having some behavioral psychologists or whoever presenting on these things to personal trainers and strength and conditioning coaches is going to be massively impactful. Yeah, I agree, man. That's a huge piece of it. Okay, right. so you've already done the big question. So let's take this in a little bit different direction. Right. What are one to two things that you've changed your mind on or maybe evolved on over the past couple of years? Uh, so I have some notes here. Okay. Um, all right. So the value of machine-based training or the value or the role of machines in training. Yeah. And in the beginning, right. And you've been in this game long enough that everything swings one into the other, right. Sure. Full wrath. Yeah, yeah. And, and then, you know, when I first got in, it was all functional training, all BOSU balls, all this, all that. <laughs> and, and machines are functional. I'm like, yeah, but now I want people to feel what I want them to feel very quickly. And machines are a great way to yeah. do that, that they get the sensation instead of, the client or member getting super frustrated because they're having a hard time balancing or, you know, um, the stability proprioception is just too much for them or the exercise is challenging. Like, let me put you on a leg press or yeah. a hack squat or something and get you to feel what I want you to feel. And then integrating other, other components, other single leg training, other things into that. Right. Um, sure. So that's something I've um, I've done a complete 180 on. 
And then other things, I mean, like just the role of like tribalism in, in the training game and like people just, you know, like they take these continuing education courses on movement, whether it's, whether it's, you know, PRI or FRC or FMS or GOTA or whoever, you know, whatever. And it's just like, that's all they, that's the only lens that they can think through. Yeah. Right. And it's not like there's, there's benefits of having a well-rounded approach. And there's things that um, from each, from each tribe or from each, you know, continuing education place that are impactful and are great. And you could take bits and pieces from one another. And, you know, I just think that that tribalism, like really needs to really needs to go away and is limiting people. And, you know, one last thing, I know you only asked for two, but just like focusing on the minutia, like, you know, I know we talked about this, you know, off probably through Instagram a couple months ago, but, you know, you have all these coaches arguing about biomechanic minutia and all this (laughs) other type of stuff. And like 60% of the population is overweight, needs to walk more and eat vegetables. Like I, you know what I mean? Like what, what are we doing here? And people need to train with more intensity. This is not like, I, I like, I really don't get me wrong. Like biomechanics matter, but to the degree they matter in somebody who's trying to lose 50 pounds is yeah. like, is it, it, And I just, it really frustrates me when, when that's the route we're going because, you know, you're in this silo of coaches you follow or whatever. And everybody's talking about biomechanics and hip internal rotation and gait cycles and all this other type of stuff. And then you go walk into a commercial gym and you look around and you're like, Oh wow. Like none of this shit really matters. Like people need, people (laughs) need better exercise selection. They need to walk more. They need to eat vegetables and they need to follow a training program. Yeah. So like, what, what do you think? Like, is there something that you like did a complete 180 on in the last year or two? Uh, no, the machine thing, definitely, I think I've come full circle on that. Um, I think that was something. Well, first off, look, if you part of this is logistics. So when you open a gym, and this is coming really full circle on this conversation, when you open a right. gym, you realize very quickly, like if you're going to buy a piece of equipment, one of the first filters you put on the kind of on the table is what all can I use this piece of equipment for? Right. So a leg extension, unfortunately, is good for exactly one thing, extending right. a knee, right? So, right, right. and it's expensive versus I could buy oh like three squat racks for one leg extension. So like, that's part of it. But I, I'm 100% on board with that, that idea of, you know, be, being okay isolating stuff to get a training right. effect, right? Or to help somebody feel a muscle. But maybe it's not something I've shifted, but but something you said really rung true with me. And it's something that I've thought for a long time. It's this idea of like the guru versus the person just below the guru. Now you've done strong first stuff, right? You've been around Pavel in the past. Yep. Yep. The thing that I love about Pavel and I still love about Pavel to this day is he is very objective about who he is and what he does. Right. So we had a discussion. This was probably 2009, 2010 when I did, at the time, it was the RKC. And, yep. and I asked him, I think we were having lunch together, and I asked him, I said, well, why the kettlebell? He's like, the kettlebell for me is just a unique way to teach strength. Right? And I was like, damn, that's like so subtle. But at the time, think back, like, not all the RKCs, but like there were certain people, they were drinking the Kool-Aid, right? Like yep. the kettlebell was the only tool in the toolbox. So I think, yep. to your point, what you see a lot of times is the guru or the person at the top of the pyramid, they're pretty objective, right? Like they kind of know who they are and what they do and they know that they have a piece of the puzzle. But sometimes it's the people that are a tier or two below, they're just, they're lost in the sauce, man. Like yep. those are the people that worry me, right? Because it's like, if you only have one tool in your toolbox, you're probably not well-rounded. And it, it's kind of like that saying, right? If your only tool is a hammer, the world is a nail. Yeah, right? exactly. Like that's how those people think. So it's like, for me, I don't know if it's changing, but but as a, a point of evolution, it's coming back to, look, everything has a role, right? Everything yep. has its place. Yep. Part of your job and growing as a coach or as a trainer is trying to understand the right timing, the right place for these different interventions, and then having a lot of tools in your toolbox. So you got the right tool for the right job at the right time. You know, 
not only that, don't get me wrong. Like I love, I love the kettlebell, but I'd be lying to say if everybody trains with one, a lot of people, like as the bell gets heavier, it's uncomfortable for them to hold. It's uncomfortable on the wrist. And that's where, that's where I think there's benefits for machines. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. we could still get a progressive training effect without, you know, you being so uncomfortable or so annoyed with how the bell sits or like heavier dumbbells on your wrists and elbows and stuff like that. So that's where, that's where I kind of see all of these tools fitting in. I Everything has its place. For sure. Okay, man. I know we're up against the gun here. You got a client coming up. So let's jump into our lightning round. All right. And I got yes, new sir. questions. I'm pretty excited about these. So some of these should be fun. All right. Number yeah. one, what was your first car? Oh man. So I had a 99 black Honda Civic, like a fast and furious edition. Like Let's I, so go. I probably, so I had, so, so I graduated high school in 2003. So I probably got the car right then, like maybe my senior year towards the end of my senior year. Okay. And that might've been like after the first fast and furious came out or like before the second. So once I got it, I had what, like a aftermarket muffler. So it was just yeah. loud as hell. And then I had all these like neon lights under the car and inside it was, oh my God, all these different taillights. It was all blacked out. Um, yeah. So that was, that was, that was my first car. What was yours? Oh my gosh. 1984 Cutlass Sierra. Nice. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Got it. One of my dad's friends that he taught with, it was like his daughter's car. She was going to college. So I got it for 2000 bucks. There you Re go. Can't beat that. Wrecked it five weeks in. <laughs> oh, nice. that's a story nice. for another day uh number two what was the first concert you ever saw oh man um i saw eminem actually um it was eminem um exhibit who else was there it was one of it was one of those tours and it was like an, at an outdoor festival in hartford okay um so i might have been like 2000 or 2001 something okay. like that it wasn't it wasn't like the chronic tour yeah or the chronic 2001 tour but like a subset of that and that's it was awesome. great it was great that'd be a that'd be a good show okay yeah, for sure this is one of my favorites it's the first time i've ever asked it on air i put it out in the world in other places but this one's fun what song or artist would you secretly jam to in your car but are embarrassed to admit? So I wouldn't say like I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I don't know about you, but I was raised off of Motown music. Okay. So I'm not embarrassed about Motown. So no, not at all. So I just wrote down some names like the Supremes, the Commodores, the Four Tops, the Temptations, the Jackson Five, yeah. um, Jay and the Americans. Jay and the Americans is actually in the 50s. Um, okay. And then Marvin Gaye. So, um, yeah, like that's what I'll jam to all the time. And people are just very surprised by that because I'm <laughs> such a nineties and early two thousands hip hop head. Right. Um, that they're kind of, they're kind of surprised by that, but, um, yeah. And if I was actually to sing, I've never sung karaoke before. Have you once once what was the song Humpty dance? Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um so i I'd, I'd probably sing some sort of motown song i think it's um come a little bit closer by jay and the americans it's oh, yeah. actually in the you know that song it guardians was of the, the galaxy uh, yeah guardians of the galaxy yeah. you know that's actually so i bought my girlfriend a record player last year for christmas and that was the first record i got was the guardians soundtrack. oh that's awesome oh it's so great um but yeah i'd probably sing that song as like my only um my only karaoke song i wish i had video of that that's awesome <laughs> Okay, number four. You have to make one meal to impress your significant other. What's it going to be? Yeah, so this is actually the meal that impressed my current uh, significant other. It was so I make a spinach and mushroom risotto, Ooh, and I okay. did it with a re did it with a reverse sear of steak. Yes, we've talked Speaking about of this. the reverse sear. Have I you done it yet? I haven't done it yet. I haven't done it yet. I'm scared, man. I'm scared. I don't want to screw it up. Well, yeah, you got to get a you got to get it where it's like you're just going to cook it for yourself. Like maybe your wife and the kids are away. So okay. if you mess it up, then it's just for you. It's not like you mess up dinner for the whole family. Yeah. You know what I mean? What's what's that like cooking dinner just for yourself? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that's like. I don't know what that's like. OK, I lied. I've actually got two more. Number five, whatever number we're at now. What is it like taking your barber on vacation with you? Oh my gosh. So I was a guest with him. So, he, so, so I'm in the chair. Right. And then he's telling me he's taking his wife away for her 35th birthday or to celebrate her 35th birthday. And I was like, Oh yeah, just, you know, let me, let me know. Like, you know, I'll, I'll be down to go. 
And I just said it jokingly. And that night he emailed me all the details and it was like super inexpensive for us to go. And it was great. Like maybe two days in is when I got my cut and, you know, he took a lot of videos for TikTok and social media, which was great for him. And then I got to be fresh on vacation and it was great. So when we were in Colombia, um, I know we're up against the clock, but this is crazy. So we were in an Airbnb 30 minutes outside of Cartagena and we had to go through like the slums to get there. And what they told us was that I guess the Colombian government had like enslaved these people and like to pay them like retributions, whatever that means. Like they gave them the land. Okay. So it was all like, it wasn't paved. It was all like shacks and stuff like that. And then you had to go through like the jungle to get to this Airbnb that this architect had bought like right on the beach and then he has, you know, people who maintain it. And then we had two private chefs and a private bartender the entire week. Oh my gosh. That sounds yeah, amazing, ama- dude. Yeah, it was, it was a great, it was a great trip and very eye opening to like to see that part, that part of the world. Do you know what I mean? Which we, I would, neither um, of us had been to Columbia before. That's awesome, man. Okay. Last yeah. but not least, what's next for Steve Calarco? Oh man, developing the gym more. Um, I have a physical therapist on board. Um, uh, who treats out of my space currently. And then um, this is the first time I've said this publicly, but I'm actually starting my PhD next year. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Congrats, yeah. Dude. So yeah, it'll be an exercise physiology. And then all of my extra curricular courseworks or electives will be in sports psych. Um, nice. Just because as we've talked, you know, previously in the podcast that there's just a huge component to that. So like, I don't want to be a sports psychologist, but I want to know enough that I can speak that language and have intellectual conversations, um, or intellectual, well-rounded conversations about that. Uh-huh. So yeah, that, and then, um, um, I'll still train during that time. And, um, hopefully I can pick up like an adjunct professor position where I'm teaching you know, one or two classes. I think that because I didn't start undergrad till I was 25 and then I was 27 at Springfield college, I was able to connect with my professors on a different level because I wasn't 18 or 19. Right. And it allowed me to have better conversations with them. And I valued my education more because I was a non-traditional student. And I had already been training for a year or two at that time. So I want to be that for younger, younger coaches or people who are getting exercise science degrees, because a lot of the professors, you know, the, these guys, these, um, men and women like haven't been in the industry or haven't coached anybody in 20 or 30 years. Right. And they're teaching about, you know, the NSEA's recommendations or the ACSM's recommendations. And that's great. Like that's who you're accredited by. That's who you have to, um, this is the, you know, product you have to teach. But like, to be honest, when you're in front of somebody that has to lose 50 pounds and they're 10 minutes late to their session. Like, to be honest, they don't really give a shit about the ACSM's right. 30 minute guideline recommendations. Right. Right. So I think that I could offer a unique perspective to, um, to younger students. Well, yeah, just an incredibly like real world practical approach to training that they may not get somewhere right. else. Right. Exactly. I love it, man. Well, Steve, it's been amazing catching up with you here today. Where can my listeners find out more about you? Yeah, absolutely. So my personal Instagram handle is just my name, Stephen Calarco, Stephen with a PH. And then the business Instagram handle is the strength spot. WH stands for West Hartford. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, my, you can link my email into, um, into the show notes and anybody could shoot me an email, follow me on IG. And that's the best way to get in touch with me. I love it, man. Well, Steve, Thanks so much for coming on the show, brother. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me, Mike. Really appreciate it. All right, my friend. That does it for this week's episode with Stephen Calarco. Really hope you enjoyed it. As I mentioned up top, we just have these great discussions. It really feels more like it's this back and forth dialogue versus me just peppering him with questions. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took some things away from the show. And if you were interested in opening a gym before the show, I sincerely hope we didn't chase you off. It is a one of a kind feeling to open your own space. You're going to battle. You're going to struggle. But man, if you're committed to it, it is one of the absolute best things you can do in your life. So If you enjoyed this show, please do me a small favor. Go to wherever you consume podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, Amazon, 
wherever you consume them. Hit the subscribe button right now so you know each and every week when a new episode drops. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.